What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in today's episode is Sir Paul Tucker, a British economist, author, and former deputy governor of the Bank of England, where he sat on the bank's monetary policy, financial stability, and prudential policy committees. He was a member of the G20 Financial Stability Board and a director of the Bank for International Settlements, which means he has a wealth of experience working at the highest levels of some of the most important policymaking bodies and research institutions in the world. What prompted today's conversation was the recent publication of Paul's book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World. The book deals with the incredibly important but rarely discussed subject of legitimacy, the legitimacy of government, of our institutions, and of our elites, and where it intersects with the world of geopolitics. How to maintain that legitimacy while navigating a change in the balance of power may be the most important question that any policymaker or politician can try and answer. It's one that blurs the boundaries between policy fields that we're used to thinking about in isolated terms, like monetary policy, the environment, trade, even war and peace, and forces us to think more concretely about our political values and our common identities. I've been trying to tell this story since the earliest days of the podcast. Not this specific angle, but the larger story of what exactly is happening to us in Western countries. How did we arrive at this state of affairs where our societies have become more politically and culturally divided? Where our financial systems have become less responsive to the real needs of our economies? And where the international security environment has become more precarious than it has ever been in the living memories of most people? My goal in this conversation is not only to further tell this story and to advance a framework for understanding the changing world that we're living in. It's also meant to provide policymakers, business leaders, investors, and everyday citizens with a framework for how to navigate this changing world. It's a framework that's missing in our daily media discourse, consumed as it is by the culture wars and the constant need to allocate blame and indulge in tribalism and division. You can find related podcasts to this one on this week's episode page at hiddenforces.io, where you can also access the second part of today's conversation by joining one of our three content tiers. This gives you access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the second part of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you wanna join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events and dinners. You can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly important conversation with my guest, Sir Paul Tucker. Sir Paul Tucker, welcome to Hidden Forces. Well, it's very good to be here. Thank you very much. It's wonderful having you on. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book, as I was telling you before we turn on the microphones. For anyone in our audience who isn't familiar with you, can you fill us in a bit on your background? I believe you worked for over 30 years as a central banker, including as the deputy governor of the Bank of England. Did you begin your career in public policy or did you start in the private sector? Well, first of all, I've been at Harvard now for nine years. Before that, I was a central banker for 33 years, 20 years, just a bit more uh, on the staff, and then just over a dozen years as a policymaker. It's slightly easier to make it from the staff of the UK central bank to be a policymaker than it is at the Fed. The Fed would be a better place and better at its job if they promoted their best staffers up to the most senior positions. Hmm. I didn't start in the private sector, but I have worked in the private sector. I don't know whether Americans use this word, but I was seconded to an investment bank. So I was loaned to an investment bank for two years. And I did corporate finance, IPOs, M&A and stuff. And um, they thought I was good at it and tried to keep me. 
that was a source of kind of reassurance to me later. I wasn't someone, you know, there's an attitude in the city of London, the Wall Street, that people that work in the public sector couldn't get a proper job. The attitude <laughs> in institutions like mine was that people on Wall Street and the city of London were a bit dim. Of course, neither is true. And in a sense, I was kind of mildly living proof of that because I could definitely have got a job in the city of London if I had wanted one. Um, but I wanted to be a, a public servant. Do you find, I mean, this may be a difficult question for you to answer, but do you find that public servants within the Bank of England are more astute than those working at the Federal Reserve? I think it makes a lot of difference that the equivalent of the New York Fed, the kind of markets bit, is in the same building as the Washington Fed, mm. the economic research bit. And I did both. I ran the balance sheet for a while before I was... At the top of that area, I ran the open market operations, I ran government debt management, but I also for a while led part of the research team. I think it's harder to kind of make those outward facing to inward facing transitions in the Federal Reserve System than it is in in the Bank of England or indeed in in parts of the European central banks. So you retired in uh, 2014, is that right? The end of 2013, and I went to, I didn't get the top job. Um, they appointed a Canadian who was already governor of the Bank of Canada. And after there was a lag before that being announced and it happening, and then Mark and I overlapped for about three or four months. And then I moved to Harvard at the end of 2013. Mark Carney. So shortly after you retired, I think it was in 2018, you published Unelected Power, The Quest for Legitimacy in Central Banking. And the regulatory state. And your latest book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World, is what we're here to talk about today. What was Unelected Power about? And how does Global Discord build on the work that you did in that book? So Unelected Power came out about four years after I left public service. And it's about under what circumstances is it okay, decent, legitimate in a constitutional democracy to hand over so much power to unelected central bankers or unelected regulators of very various kinds or the unelected antitrust agency. And it's that's the question. It sets itself at a kind of fairly high level, but it applies it to modern day central central banking. And the Global Discord started off as a project about, well, actually the constitutional democracies don't just delegate power downwards within the state, but they pull power among themselves and international organizations and up to a point delegate to the leaders of international organizations and to some kind of tribunals. And I wanted to tackle that question. But as I thought about it, I realized that whereas in the first book, I could take for granted up to a point, the stability and decency of constitutional democracy, if you like, I could take for granted domestic order. In thinking about international organizations, you can't possibly take for granted international order, peaceful coexistence, because there isn't a, a world ruler, a world government, a world king who is preserving order. So the book is ambitious. It is. It tries to frame a debate about international organizations within a debate about peaceful coexistence amongst rivals, which of course is pertinent. And I was very conscious about this while I was writing it. It's pertinent because China has risen and in some respects represents a challenge to Western states, to the United States, to mm. parts of Europe, and to what we have all taken for granted for the past 70 years, and particularly for the past 30 years. How much of your thinking around the first book was influenced by the events that transpired in, in the European Union. So one, of course, you have Brexit, and that directly deals with the question of domestic legitimacy and the legitimacy of a supranational organization. But then we also saw in cases like Italy and Greece, where technocrats were put into power in order to deal with budgetary crises. So how much of that was sort of top of mind in your interest in this area? It didn't spur the book. I come from a country with a very strong parliamentary tradition. The parliament goes back almost a thousand years. 
it's, I mean, obviously there wasn't full franchise until early 20th century, but for a democracy like ours to hand over so much power to an independent central bank is a really big thing. But it bears on the issue, the book bears on the issues that you raise. Um, I mean, I would tend to look askance at the use of technocratic prime ministers in Italy and Greece. These are people I know, some of them, by the way. So I'm not making ad hominem comments about them. But I once joked to the governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mervyn King, can't remember whether it was when Mario Draghi became prime minister of Italy or when Lucas Papadimus became prime minister <laughs> of Greece. I said, well, if we carry on like this, you may become prime minister in Britain. And I just want you to know that if you do, I'm leaving the country. And Mervyn replied, well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, we, we, we believe very strongly in the big decisions being taken by elected people. The US is a bit less committed to that than we are, but, <laughs> but the US is committed to it. So let's talk about the book, Paul, because as I said, it's a fascinating book. It's very dense and it is, I would describe it as a kind of meditation on the nature and legitimacy of political and institutional power. And in this sense, it's unusual because it's at various times philosophical, it's historical, and some of the arguments that you make in the book are also very practical. And the central question that seems to emanate from the book is how can states find ways to cooperate that grapple honestly with the evolving balance of power in the world without simultaneously undermining the social contract from which they derive their ruling legitimacy? Do you think that's an overall accurate description of the approach that you've taken in the book? And would you agree with that specific framing of the question? Yes. So I do agree with that. I wouldn't use the word social contract. I don't write in the tradition of Hobbes, Locke, Kant, and others. But yes, um, let me say this about the book. I mean, I hope the book is reasonably clearly written. The, the subject is dense, I agree. It's for potential readers, it's about 450 pages long. The first 350 pages is the argument, and the last 100 pages is the applications to to the monetary system, the trade system, and the financial system, and so on. It will be possible to read the first 350 pages and not bother with the economic stuff. It would be, the reason I'm saying all of that is that a lot of people, when they talk about international organizations or international corporation, they jump straight into the case of trade or the case of, I don't know, pandemic coordination or something. And they take for granted all sorts of things in the background, including their own assumptions. And we have to think about kind of what those assumptions are a bit. And, and you know, a really massive thing for me personally, but I think for most people is, well, there are great advantages to cooperating with other countries, but we don't want to lose our sense of ourselves or our way of life. And we've been able to take that for granted because the last 150, 200 years have been dominated by Western states. I mean, crudely, my country followed by yours. And so when my country was no longer the top dog, your country became the top dog, had been a bigger economy for a long while. And that was no doubt irritating to London, but it wasn't more than irritating in truth. You know, this was all kind of fine for Europeans. Europeans got a very good deal out of the post Second World War settlement. So did you get a good deal out of it. This is something that kind of worked for everybody. And what we've taken for granted for so long can't be taken for granted when a state with a completely different history rises, as it was bound to happen eventually. But more importantly, a state that has got a completely different system of government, dominated by the party, dominated by the party leadership. And it will want to by its lights, restore itself as one of the great nations of the, of the world and won't want to organize international affairs in the way that, that we have. And we see that in patterns of trade and cross-border investment. We see it in Chinese acquiescence in Putin's war on Ukraine. We see it in the way that China has been investing in 
strategic assets that are not just economic, but are strategic in the security sense around the world. And that's a change. Because in the Cold War, we might come onto the Cold War, but in the Cold War, there was rivalry, but it was essentially a security rivalry. It wasn't an economic mm. rivalry as, as well. There were two bifurcated blocks. So let's talk a little bit. Let's. I, I would like to to stay on this topic of legitimacy because I think it's actually something that not many authors explore. And I was very happy to see you talk about it in the book. And I think it's crucial because I think we are at a period today, certainly in the United States, and I've the case has been also true in the UK and Europe, where citizens, more citizens question the legitimacy of their institutions. And in the US, there have been two very specific, I think, moments where this process accelerated. One was the Iraq war in 2003, and the other was the 2008 financial crisis. And both of these in the US, because of the US's imperial role or hegemonic role, have a direct effect on the global order. How do we think about this concept of legitimacy? And why is it important in the context of governing? Oh, th think of legitimacy as acquiescing in power, the authority of government, and for principled reasons. Not necessarily principled reasons that everybody in every bar in the nation could articulate, but actually in a casual way they'd be able to say how their system of government works that they elect the president they elect their local representatives and that this matters to them that they can go to a court and they're all equal before the law that no one has all of the power it's not a kind of medieval monarchy in some sense and that matters to people they put it in their own words so it's not just that they acquiesce um, in that, you know, it's all fine. They've kind of got some reasons for it as well. And actually, there was a marvelous period in US history, which I think you've largely given up when civics were taught in your schools. I'd get mm. back to that if I were you. And so here's why, that's what kind of what it is, if, if you like. Here's why it matters. It's that stuff goes wrong in governing, whether you're governing a municipality or a state or a, a nation or a kind of nation continent, as in the in the United States. Stuff goes wrong. And stuff goes wrong because of incompetence and bad luck and occasionally because of malfeasance. And what legitimacy does is it kind of provides a cushion. And actually, democracy is brilliant for this. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Because the way to think about representative democracy is that it separates how we feel about the, our incumbent governors and how we feel about the system of government. So we can be very fed up with the people, the specific people that govern us in my country, the Tories or Labour or whoever, in your country, whichever party of the president it is or in Congress. And we can vote them out. You can vote them out. And you can be really fed up. But that's not the same as saying, I'm fed up with this system of government. And actually, the system of government only comes under pressure in those circumstances when there seems to be no one we can vote that will do a tolerably decent job in both senses of decent, or where the courts seem to have gone off the rails, which I'm not suggesting they have. And this kind of cushion it provides us is precious. Because if, if it was just, they're doing a good job, my life's working out okay, I mean, the system would be very brittle. So legitimacy and that aspect of democratic legitimacy is tremendously important. So when we pull power internationally, it's really important we don't undermine that legitimacy at home by giving too much power to international organizations because they obviously don't work in quite the same way. I mean, our elected representatives go off to them or people who are answerable to elected representatives. There's a habit in the States, I've experienced it with people in your Senate, who, you know, somehow international organizations are, are kind of can't be controlled by, I mean, that's not, that's a slightly fanciful, frankly. But it is true that they're not as transparent or as immediately accessible as domestic institutions are, and that, that matters. Would it be fair to say that over the last 30 or 40 years that there's been a decline in people's sense of legitimacy, both in the US and Europe? And where would you identify that decline? 
I think where would I identify the decline? In the US, in hmm. Vietnam War and Watergate and what followed from it. Slow build, slow build, and then people not being attentive to it. The element of incompetence in the way that the aftermath of the Iraq war was prosecuted. How much of that was incompetence right. of the aftermath? And also how much of it was a sense that we were not only lied into war, but also that the United States prosecuted the war without a UN approval, and that it had to basically circumvent the international institutions that it supposedly supported. So it's all of those things. And I think actually this is a good illustration of the challenge of legitimacy. I think if the US had done a magnificent job in the aftermath of the war and had built a, to help Iraqis build a, a stable, flourishing state afterwards, there would have been a degree of forgiveness mm -hmm. for the exaggeration at best of the wars of map, weapons of mass destruction and not carrying peers. Instead, it didn't do a good job in the aftermath of the war. That's where the incompetence comes in. And I think when, this is an example of where there's a degree of incompetence and actually the cushion of legitimacy isn't there. Why? I mean, France and Germany, my country went along with it, remember, but France and Germany, very experienced powers, particularly France, were saying, well, hold on, shouldn't the weapons inspectors be going back one more time? Even the person that led the weapons inspectors was saying he should go back and finish the work. And, and then it turned out that there was kind of exaggeration. This is true in the UK as well. And I think that was a kind of pretty bad moment for both my country and yours, because what this involves is sending people off to war and some of them die. And actually a really striking thing about the United States during its period as top dog, which I hope will continue for some while, compared with my country's period as top dog, is many more children, boys, men, young men, of our ruling elite in the late 19th century, early 20th century, were in the army than the children of particularly executive branch people. I think one has to be careful about this. There are plenty of people in, the, in Congress who have served in the military. Away from the defense establishment itself, relatively few members of executive, the executive branch, fam infamously almost a whole series of presidents, um, were able to duck serving in the military. That was not the case. I, mean, I think my country, you know, for a moment of historical reflection, the First World War was absolutely ghastly, people being sent over the top to certain death. And I think one of the things that held my country together in the aftermath, because it was a disgrace, was that the young lieutenants and captains that went over the top with them, they were the sons of people in government and the ruling class. And so it was incompetence, but it wasn't incompetence that was, if you like, asymmetrically directed regular people rather than the elite itself. So I do think the Iraq war is, I mean, this terrible expression, you have a flyover mm. country, God almighty, <laughs> God almighty. That's where your military comes from. And, you know, the two great pillars of your power, thank God for your power, the two great pillars are your military and my, my former world, mm. the dollar and its place in the world. Well, that leads us to a conversation about 2008. And so we, we touched briefly on the Iraq war and its impact on the legitimacy of American hegemonic power and some of the international governing institutions that make up what we broadly call the rules-based liberal order. What impact did the 2008 financial crisis have on the legitimacy or perceived legitimacy of the US dollar, the international financial dollar-based trading system and the skill set and competencies of America's central bankers in managing all of that? So I think one has to distinguish the immediate international effects and then the domestic effects. The international effects, of course, was to embolden Beijing. Beijing's response was 
Washington's not on great form and the West isn't on great form because after all, they've been running something that some people I don't actually call financial capitalism and their financial system has just imploded. And it did completely implode. And it was the banking system at the very heart of the um, how any economy these days works. And um, the then governor of the Central Bank of China gave a speech, I think in 2009, sometime around then, saying, actually, you know, we ought to be moving away from the dollar or any single currency. We ought to be moving towards a kind of pooled currency for the world to be the world's main reserve currency. So they, they saw, and they became, and China became a bit more assertive in the South China Sea during that period as well. Domestically, I think that there was a kind of massive thing. And actually, this again bridges my first book to this latest book, Global Discord, in that there was a feeling across the United States among regular people, which is they've bailed out Wall Street, not Main Street. And I mean, I think the truth of the matter is that policymakers genuinely thought the best way of helping regular people and to avoid the Great Depression and we did avoid a repeat of the Great Depression, was to, was to prop up the banks. But it was really important that elected politicians deliver that message to the people. And if I ask what face you associate with getting the United States, and in fact the world, out of the Great Depression, most people in your country, and actually most people in Europe, would say F.D. Roosevelt. If you ask people about the great financial crisis, they don't say George Bush II or President Obama. They kind of struggle to remember the names or try to think of the names of that central banker, Bernanke, or they don't need to know the names, Paulson and Geithner. The thing about these people, all of whom I know and respect, is, and the same truth is in the UK, people like that don't have the gift of speaking to people in the bars and in their kitchens and in the car on the way to work in the way that politicians do. Politicians find words, Roosevelt did this, that kind of make sense. And this isn't just a gift that people are born with. It comes from years and years of running for election and not being elected and being elected. And I think that was a terrible mistake. The people to explain why we're bailing out Wall Street in order to help you needed to be the elected people. And I don't think that happened as much as it should. We got closer to it than this country, by the way. Our parliamentary system, I mean, our parliamentary system's got lots of problems, but one of its virtues is when you do a big thing, the prime minister, you, everyone in your country has seen it at some point or another. Our prime minister has to be there on the floor of the house answering questions, and that dominates the, the newsreels. So I think the Iraq war was one kind of blow, and I think the great financial crisis was another blow. Of course, in the background is just kind of low underlying growth, slow underlying growth for years, and a feeling that things are a bit unfair. Did monetary policy in the years since the crisis exacerbate some of the distributional problems that we sort of touched on briefly earlier and that have led to an undermining of legitimacy of some of these institutions? Yes, but I don't think one should blame the central bankers for that. So when you're faced with a horrible economic shock, as my tribe calls it, you've got two choices. You can use monetary policy or fiscal policy, but then there's a lovely third choice where you do a bit of both. And we over-relied on monetary policy. And to get a bit technical, what monetary policy does is it pulls interest rates down, and so it pushes asset prices up. And that you know, kept people in jobs. Pretty shallow recession after the great financial crisis. Didn't go into the Great Depression again. That's an extraordinary achievement. That's something to be, I think my peers can be proud of. But if there's reliance on fiscal policy instead, then you don't get the low interest rates all the way along your curve. You don't get asset prices going up so much, and you can direct resources a bit more to where the Congress of the day wants. So yeah, I think what happened though is the fiscal policymakers didn't want to do that, and so the monetary policymakers just had to do more. 
For those of you readers that know any game theory, this is a Stachelberg game. Fiscal policymaker moves first. When they choose to sit on their hands, the monetary policymaker who moves second just has to do more. That was the right thing to do, but it generated all sorts of distortions, not the least of which is these the increase in wealth for the rich and therefore the sense that the system is unfair. So I want to bring it back to the international relations dimensions that you work through in the book and specifically the four different scenarios for the future that you discuss. Before we do that, it might be helpful just to have an overview of how we came to have the international institutions that we have today, because you spend some time in the book, as I said, not just on the philosophical arguments, but also on the historical, on the history of of how we built these kind of concentric circles of legitimacy. Could you sort of walk us through that part of the book and how we got to where we are today in terms of what the international system looks like? Potted history sketch for the last 500 years coming up. So before the Protestant Reformation in Europe in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, there are no states as such in the way that we would recognize. There are kings and things, but everybody ultimately recognizes the authority of the Pope or the authority of the Holy Roman Emperor in, in Germany, Austria. And that changes after the wars of religion because there is no single authority that can adjudicate disputes between princes. And so gradually, gradually through the Treaty of Westphalia, the Treaty of Utrecht, we move to a system of territorial states with local sovereignty. That's the first step in the game. During the 18th century, 19th century, the balance of power develops. And in particular, after the Napoleonic Wars, the balance of power starts to become institutionalized with what's called the Concert of Europe, when the great powers of Europe would meet to ensure that conflict wasn't breaking out across Europe. And that was an incredibly important moment because they started meeting on other things as well. So in the late part of the 19th century, there are three international gatherings on the international monetary system. And by then, the United States has become rich enough to be present And the debate is about incredibly arcane things like whether to use gold or whether to use silver. At the end of the 19th century, there is an agreement to set up the Court of Arbitration, which exists in um, The Hague. That partly came out of the use of arbitration between the United States and the UK to settle some longstanding disputes between our two countries. After the First World War, There was an effort to create more formal institutions, the League of Nations, and to commit jointly to to maintain peace kind of across the planet. That manifestly failed. After the Second World War, led very much much by the United States, there was a second attempt to do that with more determination and more careful design. The discussions were a remarkable thing about the Second World War is that your country, because you weren't you were in the war by then, but it wasn't on your territory. You hosted meetings on what became the United Nations, on what became the IMF and the World Bank, on what became the trade system, the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. This is a remarkable period of institution building. And people agree by then that you have to sit around the table. And of course, modern transportation, aeroplanes has made it possible. And then that The Cold War, after the Second World War, as the Cold War begins, the Soviet Union kind of backs out of almost everything. So we have a bifurcated world. And when the Cold War ends, there's an extraordinary period of about 20 years when lots more international organizations are created. The gap becomes the World Trade Organization. The law of the sea is Mm. is further developed. Law of the sea is not to be neglected, you know, Most of the stuff we all consume, even in the United States, even in the continent of Europe, which is a massive economy as well, a lot of stuff comes to us by sea. Well, it gets here only if the sea lanes are free. Your Navy does that, maintains that around the world. My country's Navy did that for about 150 years. There are conventions around all of that. The Malacca Straits are international waters, even though they're narrow. This is a kind of remarkable 
achievement and has served everybody really well and is not the same as world government. It is not the same. It isn't some conspiracy against individual nations. But of course, mistakes can be made in design and it can go too far, as I think has happened in some respects. They are 500 years in, a, in about three minutes. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I was telling <laughs> you in an email that I'm fascinated. One of the things that has interested me, generally speaking, is the brevity of the period of unipolarity, whether or not it could have been sustained. In other words, if there were things that could have been done differently, for example, was the Iraq war really something that accelerated the move away from unipolarity? And I'm also interested how and when the U.S. began to move from having a, a view of international relations which makes much more space for dealing with countries that don't share our values to this more stringent view that not only do we want to intervene and change and engage in regime change, which is something that has come up quite a bit in American policy circles, but also where somehow we can't really deal with countries that don't share our values. And a recent example of this is Saudi Arabia in the last you know decade or so where relations between the US and Saudi Arabia were increasingly fraught. And of course, in the last few years, that hasn't served us very well. I'm curious if you have any views on that, on how that, that evolved, if that evolution began really under the Reagan administration, or if it really was after the end of the Cold War. So let me, I will come to that. And if I don't, just remind me, you've started off by saying, what was it ever realistic to think that unipolarity would go mm. on kind of indefinitely. I mean, obviously not, not because of what's happened, because it only required one country with a large population to grow pretty fast for a number of years for them to become a power. It happens to have been China, could be India, could have been Brazil, could be Indonesia. I mean, and I think over the next century, we'll see a number of these countries become great powers. So I don't think we should be at all surprised that eventually unipolarity came to an end. I think we could be you know, a bit surprised by exactly when it happened. I think we can be disappointed with ourselves, and I think the US can be disappointed with itself about how it handled the period of unipolarity, which I think essentially was because it wasn't thinking forward to the end of unipolarity. And this goes back to the second part of your question, did this happen only after the end of the Cold War or did it begin with Reagan and where it is this kind of projection of everybody needs to be like us, that we are going to, we are going to push our system of government onto other parts of the world, which is different from seeking peaceful coexistence with them. It's saying we've, we've answered the questions of how best to, to rule ourselves, and you ought to follow what I do and what we do. And I think in this respect, the United States as hegemon has been very different from Britain. There's a famous speech in House of Commons by Prime Minister Pitt, where he argues, actually, he'd stopped being prime minister and he's responding to somebody else. And he says, you've got to let other countries get to to liberty and freedom in their own way. You can't tell them exactly, you can't force it on them and you can't tell them exactly how to do it. I think that was wise. And I think that I've changed my mind on this next thing. For a long time, I thought the whole business about the end of history and Fukuyama's famous book, I don't know how important the book was, but I do think there was an atmosphere of, we've now answered all of the questions and everybody else ought to do it a bit like us. That was not prudent. Mm. <laughs> it's not the best way of prevailing. And this isn't for people listening. This isn't some kind of apologist. Oh, you know, other systems should be allowed to flourish. He's just, you know, communism should be allowed to flourish. No, no, this is about how best to prevail. And you don't always prevail by walking up to somebody in the playground and saying, do what I do. So, and I think there was a slight atmosphere of overexcitement. There's a concrete example in the World Trade Organization, which we could come to later if you like, or I could talk about it now. Either. Either is fine. Go ahead and talk about it now. It's something that you, you speak about quite a bit in the book as well. Yeah, this is chapter 17 of the book. So it, a few years ago now, there was a famous um, dispute in the, in the WTO trade system where China had been using state-owned enterprises to, to subsidize exports. 
And the United States, understandably, I think, said, well, that's not allowed under the rules of the WTO. So if you're doing that, we're allowed to employ what are technically called countervailing measures, what practically means imposing their own tariffs. So China reduces the prices and the United States pushes them back up. And China said, no, no, that actually are the subsidies you're complaining about, they are legal, and therefore your tariffs are illegal. And we're, they go off to the WTO and China wins. And they win on a kind of crazy point in my view, which is the appellate board, which like a court, decides that state-owned enterprises aren't public bodies within the meaning of the treaty. So this is all a question of law, and therefore the United States can't do what it wants to do. But here's the big point. So that's a kind of pretty bad decision in my view by the appellate board, but judges make bad decisions. And what we normally do is we let the backward looking decisions stand, and then we amend the law in a forward looking way, because we'd say, well, actually we don't agree to, um, state-owned enterprises should be treated as though they're outside of the state, because they're not. Now, what would normally happen between nations in those circumstances, it's not like a domestic parliament, is you'd have a negotiation, some bargaining, in this case between Washington and Beijing, and probably with the other great trade power there, the EU, massive trade power, and possibly Tokyo. And they'd come up with some kind of bargain, and China would be bit less well off than it would otherwise have been. And the US would get back, claw back some of its losses, but not all of them. And everyone would leave the table feeling a bit relieved and a bit fed up. That's what bargains are like. And I think that could have happened. But at the WTO, any such, to put that into the rule book, there has to be a vote of the whole membership. And every member has a veto. Every member has a veto over the rules. So even if those four agreed, somebody else would veto that. And then you say, well, actually, that's veto. It's crazy. We should get rid of the veto. Well, that itself is subject to the veto. And this goes back to, this is almost the best example of what happened in the heady days of the, at the end of the Cold War in the Create the WTO, which has done, been an incredibly important and useful organization for everybody, sorted out tons of disputes between the US and the EU, in a sense, the two great trade powers of the world, and have done so amicably. But the designers of this system essentially assumed that they'd either written down the perfect contract that could cover every situation. That's obviously a daft thought because you don't know what technologies are going to develop and so on. And they also effectively assumed that any future rising state, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, who knows who, would essentially accept the liberal version of trade that was the tradition of the, the gap system. Well, China doesn't. And that alone doesn't make China bad, by the way. I mean, I think some other things are more worrying. That's just the organization should have catered for that. It should have, and by giving absolutely everybody a veto, you've made it impossible to change the system, including in our interests. And so I think this was a period of not arrogant triumphalism in the worst sense of the word, but a kind of casual triumphalism that was careless about thinking the design of institutions. That's slightly tough words, but they're, they've what I've come to think, I'm afraid. You can hear that also in the language of America's politicians. Barack Obama often talked about the arc of history bending towards liberty and freedom. And of course, the working assumption around China was that as they became increasingly integrated into the global economy and they became wealthier and more prosperous, that they would see the logic of the system that we currently have and that the Chinese Communist Party itself would become more liberal. Is your view that that was just ultimately naive, or could you see the logic at the time? And I'm curious actually to know what your thinking was at that time. Naive. I don't think it was crazy to think that it was possible. It plainly was. I think it was crazy to have all one's chips on that. Crazy. And how much of that do you think was the result of the 9-11 attacks and the overwhelming focus on counterterrorism and prosecuting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That in other words, it wasn't, it was less that we couldn't see the long-term challenge, but rather that the US foreign policy establishment was consumed 
by the clear and present danger of Islamic terrorism and the giant nation-building projects that it had taken on in the Middle East and Central Asia. I mean, if that is the explanation, it would be remarkable. I mean, I've never had to take decisions as big as going to war. But you're dealing with one issue and you're very tired and you haven't been, had much sleep and then you go to a meeting about another issue. You're still required to, uh, to think about possible outcomes. And so you say, well, actually, will this lead to China liberalizing politically? And some people in the room say yes. And be, but somebody else surely has said, well, what if they don't? And it has to be possible for that thought to, to percolate in the room. This is what good policymaking does. And, and somebody says, well, actually, I'm not sure I agree with you, but say they don't liberalize politically, what would happen then? And how would we feel about the, you know, this WTO thing or some other thing? And any of us only have to look back on our own histories to see that there isn't any inevitability. You had a civil war. Over a thousand mm-hmm. years, we had three. You know, it's getting reform and getting to the liberal state wasn't something that kind of happened in a fortnight. That's why I started with the wars of religion. I mean, 30 years and a lot of blood, a lot, a lot of slaughter. That this thing that we have that is so precious and that we must hold on to, this wasn't something, I don't know, that, that came all packaged up in a ribbon for us. We got there by trial and error. Well, well, if we got there by trial and error, why do we think that others would look at us and say, well, that's the best system? Because actually, you know, why shouldn't they try to find something in their own history? Mm. And it's not that, that we think, oh, well, our own history might be better than ours. I mean, that's irrelevant. It's being realistic enough to know that they may think their own history is has something to offer them. And you, are, you, you asked, I want to say something about Saudi, and I want to say something about not about the Reagan administration per se, but the exchange between us is making it sound as though all, all of this was rooted in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War. Well, I don't think that's right, actually. I mean, I think the Reagan administration had a triumphant air to it. I mean, changing toppling governments here and there. Mm. I mean, what has been the price way before Reagan? Was it, I think it was probably the Eisenhower government may have been Truman, I think it was the Eisenhower government that toppled the rulers in Iran. That still affects Iranian relations with my country and with yours. Lots of people sided with the radical clerics in 1979, not because they were fundamentalist Shia Islamists, but because they wanted to escape from a ruler who was too close to the West, the Western countries who had engineered a coup in in the middle 1950s. So we leave, live with these things for a long time. But there's an extraordinary story about Saudi mm. Arabia, and I think a good one from the West's point of view. I don't want to be down on everything, for God's sake. I mean, there are plenty. Otherwise, we wouldn't be as prosperous as we are if we hadn't got lots of things right. So the end of the 1960s and early 1970s is going pretty badly. Vietnam, Watergate, the end of Bretton Woods, all of that is kind of pretty ugly. And there's great worries in Washington after the end of Bretton Woods, whether the dollar will continue to be an effective world reserve currency. And there is a a delegation goes from Washington to Saudi Arabia. I think it drawn from both State Department and the Treasury Department, but I may have that wrong. And basically, of course, it's more complicated than this, but basically the negotiation is we, the United States, will continue to provide you with security, help, armaments, and training, and so on, so long as you continue to invoice oil in dollars. That's about as grown up a negotiation as you can get. And of course, in today's world, it would be a massive thing if any of the Gulf powers decided to invoice oil in renminbi. I mean, I think those people that made that trip did exactly the right thing. And this is a problem of dirty hands. I mean, Saudi Arabia does things that are just not admirable, to put it at its lowest. But what they have in the ground there is still very important to the way the world works. And we need them at least to be kind of neutral, tilting to our side and 
the security relationships with them are tremendously important. Hmm. The other thing that's also interesting is when you say that they do things that aren't admirable, true. And But I think also we do many things that aren't. And I think this kind of gets back to the question of legitimacy. And when we're thinking about shared values of other countries or other nations, it seems that what we're really talking about is how do those nations treat their citizens or the people within their territories, not necessarily how they treat people outside of those territories. Would you say that that's accurate? Broadly, yes, but I don't want to drive a, such a clear wedge because I think the question anybody has, if you see a country treating some of its people very badly, a sensible question to ask oneself is, would they treat us like that if they could? Mm. And the answer is sometimes no, but it isn't always no. So let me give you a concrete example. Europeans did not admire the way that the United States treated black Americans in the 1960s and the 1970s and beyond. I mean, that was a kind of awkwardness. But the United States, the judgment was quite rightly that the United States was no threat to us at all. But I think one starts with that. And of course, I've just given one example. Another example would be the treatment of of the Native Americans. Hmm. But I think that the... There are things in our past, certainly my country's past, and in your country's past, which we can hardly be proud of. One of the things that's important about liberalism, I use the word liberal, by the way, in a European sense, not in a mm. an American sense to mean left wing. It just doesn't mean that in Europe. It, it, it's far more centrist. In, it means freedom and stuff. Sure, it's more associated with libertarianism in the US. Yeah, well, you should get back to using it in the European way or find a new word for. No, that's how I tend to use it, actually. I use progressivism yeah. to describe what people typically refer to as liberalism or certainly who used to refer to as liberalism. I think that word has changed a bit to mean more of what you describe in recent yeah. years, at least since the 2008 financial crisis, than it did in the 1990s. Actually, even when you use the word progressive, often one just means left wing, and and on the other side, often one just means right wing. Mm. But the point I was going to make is the thing about liberal societies is they allow debate. And so we've treated people badly, but there then becomes pressure from within the society to change. And that's tremendously important. And it doesn't always work, or it often doesn't work quickly enough, but it gradually, gradually tends to work. And I think other countries, if they treat their, some of their citizens badly, they can't look at our societies and say, well, you did that to the such and such people, and therefore it's okay for, for them to treat, I don't know, the Uyghur Muslims badly or the Tibetans badly or whoever, mm. or, or these days perhaps some Muslim communities in India. Instead, look at what we regret as well as what we're proud of. Mm. You know, the fact that we made mistakes earlier isn't some kind of warrant for either ourselves or anybody else to go around behaving badly today. Yeah, it, it oftentimes feels like foreign governments try to make the argument, well, look, you got to do all these bad things in your past, and now look where you are today. We get to do them too in our rise. And I think also because of some of the hypocrisies of American foreign policy and some of the mistakes, and again, without dwelling on them too much, I also think it's important to recognize that mistakes happen in policy. We have, we hold, I think we hold politicians and policymakers to an impossible standard. And maybe that's just inevitable. Maybe that's good. And that's what we should do, regardless of whether it's realistic or not. But because of this, a lot of people in the US oftentimes make excuses for foreign governments that engage in reprehensible behavior, whether it is the what's going on in Xinjiang, in China, or with the invasion of Ukraine. Sir Paul, I'm going to move us to the second part of our conversation, yeah. and that's where I really want to focus on the practical part of the book. I want to focus in on the four different scenarios for the trajectory of the global order that you explore in the book. And also what the implications are of that order for businesses, for economies, and for asset managers, because they have to now deal with a world that isn't sort of set in stone where markets can exist within a stable foundation, 
the foundation, the political foundation itself is changing, which impacts everything above ground in a way that you know most investors alive today really haven't had to deal with. And I also would like to end discussing what the best way forward is, how you think American foreign policy, the foreign policy of, of Western liberal states, and in this case, by Western, I guess I could include really any liberal democratic society, even if it is a society in Asia, what is the best way to maintain internal legitimacy while at the same time making room to exist and have relations with countries that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with or have thick values, as you described them, or deep values, so that we can actually get to a place of of having a sustainable order and not something that devolves into chaos or to, God forbid, global war, which I think has become a concern of many people, if not something that's become increasingly plausible. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Sir Paul, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Sir Paul, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.